You are loved with an everlasting love. That's what the Bible says. And underneath are the everlasting arms. We've been telling the story of Through Gates of Splendor, the first book that I ever wrote about five American missionaries, one of whom was my husband, Jim Elliott. They attempted in 1956 to reach an unreached people called Alka Indians in South America. These people had never heard the gospel, had never been contacted by anyone who came back alive. On Friday, January the 6th, 1989, at about 11 o'clock in the morning, Nate and Pete were sitting in a small cooking shelter that they had built on the sand of the Kuradai River. Ed McCauley was at the upper end of the beach, Raj was in the center, Jim at the lower end, continuing their verbal bombardments of the jungle. You remember that they had learned a very few Alka phrases from a young woman who had left her tribe years before, and they were using these phrases, which they hoped sounded friendly, in the hopes that if there were any Alkas hiding in the jungle, they would hear them and come out in a friendly way. At 11.15, their hearts jumped when a clear masculine voice boomed out from across the river, answering Ed's call. Immediately, three Alkas stepped out into the open. They were a young man and two women, one about 30 years of age, the other a girl of about 16, naked except for strings tied around the waist, wrists, and thighs, and large wooden plugs in distended earlobes. The missionaries, temporarily struck dumb by the surprise appearance, finally managed to shout simultaneously in Alka, Poinani, welcome. The Alka man replied with a verbal flood, pointing frequently to the girl. The missionaries, of course, understood not a single syllable of what he said, but his gestures seemed plain enough. He must be offering her for trade, said Pete, or maybe as a gift. When it seemed that the Alcas were waiting for somebody to come across, my husband, Jim Elliott, peeled down to his shorts and began wading across the river toward them. The other men said, Take it easy, buddy. You don't know what's on their minds. Jim hesitated, and the Alcas were slightly hesitant, but as Jim gradually approached, the girl edged toward the water and stepped off a log. The man and the other woman followed shortly. Jim grabbed their hands and led them across the river. Contact with Alcas. Can you imagine the thrill that after years of praying for the Alcas and after months of preparing for this contact, Jim actually took the hand of an Alca. The Alcas' uneasiness seemed to fall from them and they began jabbering happily to themselves and to the men with apparently no idea that the men couldn't understand a word they said. When the men prayed with their heads up toward their Heavenly Father, the Alcas looked completely baffled, of course. Their guns were hidden, but their cameras were visible. The Alcas seemed to have no fear whatsoever of the cameras, and the girl was interested in Time magazine, which Nate Saint had been reading as he lay up to his neck in the river just before their appearance. They gave them insect repellent. They nicknamed the man George, not having any idea what his name was, and George put the repellent on his arms and legs. He seemed to have no fear whatsoever. The most unequivocal sign of his acceptance of the missionary's friendship and their trustworthiness was his willingness to get into the plane and actually take a flight with Nate over his own territory. In the book of Ezekiel, we read, The word was in my bones as a living fire. It really was torture for the men not to be able to speak a word that these three Indians could understand. It was far from clear as to whether the few words that they thought they had been pronouncing correctly were understood. But their friendship seemed to be understood, they gave the Indians rubber bands, yo-yos, balloons, lemonade, even a hamburger with mustard on it, and a demonstration of how to build an airstrip. They stuck some sticks up into the ground, 
took their little balsa wood model airplane and zoomed it down toward the sticks and showed how if the plane hit the sticks, then it would turn over, hoping that the Indians would get the idea that they needed to build an airstrip so that the plane could land near their houses. Then, finally, Nate and Pete left because it was getting on toward sunset and they needed to get back to Arahuno. They took with them the film from the cameras with the pictures of the three Alcas that the men had taken that afternoon. And shortly after Nate's departure, the man and the younger of the two women left, George and Delilah, as they had nicknamed them. But the third woman, the older one, decided to stay. There she sat in the little cooking shack that the men had set on the beach. She seemed perfectly at ease, and when they went up to spend the night in their little tree house, she was still there. Saturday morning, January the 7th, 1956, was an anticlimax. Surely, the men had thought, the Alcas will go back and tell their people that the white man is friendly, and then maybe they will come and actually lead us to their houses. When the men had gotten up in the morning, the ashes of the fire were still warm, but the older woman had left sometime during the night. Nate flew over the Alka houses. He saw that the people appeared to be fearful. He wondered if maybe the three had not come back, and the people thought that the missionaries had killed them. But then, very quickly, there were friendly signs again, but not exactly exuberant. He was a little bit disturbed. Then he saw George, the man whom he had had contact with the day before on the beach. George was smiling. Then Ed McCulley wrote a note to Mary Lou that afternoon. Dearest baby, it's 4.30 and no sign of our visitors yet, but we believe they'll arrive, if not tonight, then early tomorrow. Thanks for the clothes and food again. We are certainly eating well. This has been a well-fed operation from start to end. I should put in a parenthesis here that Mary Lou was cooking up a storm back there in Atahuno, and every morning when Pete and Nate flew back to their camp, they flew with a plane full of food, sometimes a hot stew, sometimes warm muffins, even ice cream and ice cubes. Ed's letter goes on. We feel now that we ought to press going over there and get the airstrip in as fast as possible, but we'll have to wait and see how God leads us, and them too. Looks like Pete will be there to help you tomorrow morning. Give Stevie and Mikey my love and tell them I'll see them soon, and Carmela too. Carmela was their Indian helper. All for now, all my love, Ed. Nate was worried about the Alka's response. Were they bored? Were they fed up with these strangers? Jim reassured him. He said, That's Indian. If you landed him on the moon, he'd be satisfied in five minutes. He might be bored. George had been up in the plane, but didn't seem to have much to say about it. Didn't even seem very excited. Well, that's Indian. If you land them on the moon, they're satisfied in five minutes. Then Sunday morning, January the 8th, Pete said when he left Arahuno, so long, girls, pray. I believe today's the day. The girls he was referring to were Mary Lou, Ed's wife, and Barbara Udarian, Raj's wife, who were staying together in Arahuno. So long, girls, pray. I believe today's the day. They took ice cream, warm blueberry muffins with them. They made a flight over the Alcas on their way in, and saw only women and children. They got excited about that. By the time they had landed on the beach where the other three men were, they were exuberant. They must be on their way. We just saw ten Alcas headed in the direction of the beach. This is it, guys, Nate said. They're on their way. You can imagine the excitement with which the wives received this news by shortwave radio. Ten Alcas headed in the direction of the missionaries' camp, Lord bless them. Lord preserve them. Lord make it friendly. Lord make it the entrance for your gospel. Nate called in and said, We'll talk to you at 4.30 this afternoon. Be sure to switch on the radio. We expect a meeting with the neighbors at 
So our prayers continued to ascend during that afternoon. I was the only one of the five women who did not know what this contact was all about because I had not been in Shelmeta. I was in my own station and I was only in on a few of the contacts because of the secret nature of the operation. Each of these radio contacts had had to be in code and we were trying to keep as low a profile as possible. So I remember that afternoon I was down on the Napo River with my little daughter Valerie who was just crawling at that point. She hadn't yet learned to walk but she was crawling around on the sand and we were just having a happy time with some of the Indians wondering what was going on with the men down on the Kurarai River. So they shouted welcome. Well, that was Missionaries Meeting Stone Age People, Gateway to Joy 94. And let me remind you that uh, you can visit us at elizabethelliot.org for a lot of resources, so don't miss that.